Coming at you live once again from the lower bottoms of West Oakland. This is Sound Waves. We are coming at you live actually from the studio. And by we, I mean it's just me today. Um, I did have a very, very special guest uh, scheduled for today. Uh, an old, old friend I've known, Jesus, for about 20 years that's doing an amazing uh, fighting podcast called Cage Against, uh, but unfortunately, uh, some things came up for me and him, and this, this show had to be, I don't want to say canceled, but postponed, um, mainly because there's one thing I want to get across, and, and it kind of becomes a, a, a common theme in a lot of what we talk about, which is which is kind of equality, equity. Um, I am. I had to leave my home because I am working in an emergency shelter here in Oakland, California, and some of the patients in this shelter um, could have COVID nineteen. So to keep my family and, of course, my baby son safe, I am back at the studio. The shelter I am working in is one of the shelters that the city of Oakland ha has. It is a hotel that's vacant. There's a couple hotels that are vacant. And I am a shelter monitor in one of them. And you know, there's a lot of things I wanted to discuss. Definitely a lot of things I want to write about. I mean, since since uh, we last had a conversation on here, Bernie has dropped out, and I know a lot of people that uh, a lot of people on the left are very heartbroken by Bernie's departure from the presidential race because they put a lot of stock. We put a lot of stock in Bernie's platform. And a big thing about Bernie's platform that I always uh, try to explain to people was that Bernie Sanders was probably the first major politician in my lifetime that looked like he was trying to democratize power. And in doing so, I think we've seen what power does when it is threatened. Uh, the Democratic Party pretty much consolidated power in an unprecedented move on Super Tuesday to to defeat Bernie Sanders. And Bernie Sanders, you know, for the most part, even though he calls himself a democratic socialist, we all know, like those of us that are truly on the left know that he's not that far left. He's way more of a New Deal Democrat. And I don't say that in any sort of like criticism like a flippant criticism like fuck that guy he's not that serious it's more like he's not as he's not as rogue as the power structure would like you to think he is and it's such a sad state of affairs when a left slightly left of moderate politician wants to have some basic human needs for the American people, and we see power structures consolidate against him. And it's not just the Democratic Party. All of mainstream media worked against Bernie Sanders with a scorched earth, red scare policy that we haven't seen since the McCarthy era. So those of us that were really, you know, if you, if you donated to Bernie Sanders, if you campaigned, if you phone banked, if I know people that cross state lines to canvas for Bernie. Um, it's a bit of a disheartening feeling right now because when you have an establishment candidate like Joe Biden versus the so-called right-wing populism of Donald Trump, it is beyond the lesser of two evils. 
it's it's just what kind of evil do you prefer and people have actually hit me up personally on some what do i do shit and it's it's kind of funny because first of all as a black man in america i've never really had a presidential choice that represented my interests. I always was mildly insulted when people would say things like, well, I'm not for Bernie Sanders because he's not for reparations. I was always be like, who the fuck has been for reparations? Was Bar- what was Barack Obama's rep- reparations platform in 2008 that so many fucking black people voted for? I'd love to know. But I can't say that I've looked at a president and been like, you know what, you actually have a a black centric platform. You have a platform that's going to literally help my people or even poor people for that matter. Maybe Jesse Jackson in 88. I was I was slightly cognizant then. Um, but like seriously. So I understand why people are so upset about Bernie Sanders not being the race. That being said, it's not like fights for justice ever stopped. Black Lives Matter movement and Occupy Wall Street movement were pretty much born during the Obama administration. You know, people love Obama. He's supposed to be some sort of progressive president. Black Reagan 2.0. Extended Bush tax cuts. You got the same foreign wars. Was the so-called deporter in chief. Trump can't exacerbate kids in, in cages without Obama laying down the groundwork for that legislation. Drone warfare can't get blown out of proportion by Trump without Obama laying down that that drone fighting precedent. That being said, when people are scared of Trump part two, I will say this again. Donald Trump is over. His mishandling of coronavirus has destroyed any chance of him becoming president once again. This is probably going to be an election where not a lot of people turn out. We don't know what voting is going to look like in the age of coronavirus. We don't know what November is going to look like. The Trump administration, in a desperate attempt to try to gain some sort of traction with Wall Street, wants to reopen the economy a little early against the fears of the people. We don't have a vaccine. We're nowhere near a vaccine. Hydrochloroquine, people, let's just be honest, is not the cure. Donald Trump is so desperate, he's blaming, literally, the World Health Organization for his mishandling of the coronavirus. It's amazing how arrogantly stupid this man is and the talking heads in his administration are. Um, I looked at the task force to reopen America that consisted of the ghoulish Steve Mnuchin, who was part of uh, not just the housing crisis, but a foreclosure crisis, profited literally billions off blood, sweat, and pain of Americans everywhere got a position as Trump's what, campaign manager and then now has the position of Treasury Secretary. So he's literally overseeing right this CARES stimulus. As I speak this uh, Thursday, April 16th, 
um, I was reading that the portion of the money that was designed, or they call it the paycheck protection portion of the stimulus that was designed for small businesses to get loans to stay open as long as they kept people on payroll and paid them a living wage, yada, yada, yada. That money's gone. But the airline industry got bailed out. People from the 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 twelve hundred one, the one time payment of twelve hundred dollars, which Steve Mnuchin went on, I believe it was Fox, or possibly CNN, to say that he felt that Americans could live for up to eight weeks on twelve hundred dollars. I don't know where. Um, kind of shows how divorced he is from the reality of the average person. You know, he doesn't know what average people pay for rent he doesn't know what average people spend on groceries and how it literally hurts their their bottom line sometimes just going out to get groceries sometimes you have to choose am i going to get gas can i put enough gas in to get to work the next couple days and get some food in me can i get gas and get diapers like he's never had to deal with with those quandaries and never will so when he is in charge of how this money is doled out and when and when you see that there's a, I don't want to say the word provision there's a, a caveat <coughs> excuse me in this stimulus of $1,200 we get that banks can take out money that you owe on even charged off debt. You got a credit card with Bank of America, couldn't pay the bill for whatever reason. Let's just be honest. A lot of us, when I say living above our means, it's not that you're out there buying a bunch of shit you can't afford. Sometimes it's just, I have to charge gas. You know, the grocery quandary, right? Gas, groceries, diapers, food, who's going to get what? Sometimes we have to charge that. God forbid we get a flat tire. And not just a patch it flat, but fucking need a new tire flat. Now you can't pay that credit card bill off like you thought you were going to. And so begins the spiraling downfall into unsecured credit card debt. And eventually a lot of us say, fuck it, I just can't pay it. Take me to collections. I'm sorry, I can't pay it. The bank charges that debt off, sells it for pennies on the dollar to a collection agency. Collection agency hounds you and hounds you. They sell it. That agency hounds you and hounds you. But eventually you pay it or don't pay it, whatever. File bankruptcy, whatever. But now Bank of America can be like, hey, we got a charged off debt here from Jason. Let's fucking take $800 out of that stimulus. Even though we got bailed out again for interest-free money again. But we definitely have to stick it to the proletariat. (sighs) That being said, Trump is over. It's not going to take much to defeat Donald Trump. That's why the Democrats feel relatively comfortable running a mildly senile Joe Biden against Donald Trump. And I know a lot of people like to go back to 2016 and say Donald Trump just eviscerated everybody in the Republican Party and he just destroyed Hillary Clinton. No one in the Republican Party in 2016 had presidential personality. Let's just be honest for a second here. We're picking leaders of this country not really based off their policy prescriptions, but we're picking them more so based off a a, a kind of a personality contest. Watching elections is kind of like watching a popularity contest. It's almost like watching a high school class president election. You know, Barack Obama, great speaker, good-looking guy, didn't 
really say much. He spoke the language of single pair. Didn't get it. Um, Bill Clinton, smooth talking guy. He spoke the language. He definitely had some serious welfare reform that hurt a lot of people. Of course, his crime bill hurt a lot of people. And let's not forget, was it 1999, him repealing the Glass-Steagall Act, which laid the foundation for the destruction of the economy in 2008. For a lot of people, George Bush Jr. I call him Jr. Just so we know who the fuck I'm talking about. I give you the H and all that other shit. But a lot of people have to go, which one was that? Which one was that? So fucking say Jr. God damn it. So Jr. So... It's a bit of a popularity contest. And Donald Trump won the popularity contest by just being a bully. And it... When you're... He's been perceived as a tough guy and a business... Um, almost like mafia figure for like 30 plus years. Home Alone 2, go watch it. Trump was supposed to be like a lovable rich guy. As he got older, he became less of this Gatsby-esque playboy that he thought he was and more of just kind of a cartoon villain. He stayed in the homes of the working class for a long time. Um, I think it was Anand Girdadas that said Donald Trump is a poor person's idea of a rich person. Yup. And he plays that role to a fucking T. That being said, a lot of people saw the cartoonish nature of him and felt very embarrassed that he was beating Hillary Clinton with not really saying anything um, funny. I mean, crooked Hillary is all you can say? That's not shocking. It's shocking on the stage of electoral politics because we really don't see the name calling that name calling usually comes from the the political pundits right bill o'reilly and the sean hannity's are going to call someone crooked hilly rush limbaugh definitely is going to have a fucked up nickname for you but for when the guy on the debate stage has the fucked up nickname and is doing all of these like pro wrestling style tactics you know he has this very 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 disgusting audio of him uh, talking about how women love him so much that he could just grab him by the fucking snatch and it's all good and he just kisses him and grabs him in the snatch and there's not a big deal with that because he's fucking Donald Trump and he can do that. A lot of us heard that and said, well, that guy's done. I mean, if Howard Dean got killed with a... You're definitely done with a snatch grab. You're raping people. You're bragging about raping people. But what did he do against Hillary Clinton? He, he trotted out all these women that said Bill Clinton had sexually assaulted them. And uh, Hillary Clinton just couldn't fight back. The odious record that Hillary Clinton has as a politician is exacerbated by her relationship to her husband that is now looked back on as not this wonderful man, but kind of a shitty dude. She had to run against the reputation of her husband and even her reputation. And I think a lot of the people that were saying Crooked Hillary didn't even understand why the fuck they were saying Crooked Hillary. Fox News ran Benghazi in the ground and she had something Donald Trump didn't have and that was a political record. Even though she's a lifelong politician and we wouldn't have had Brett Kavanaugh in the Supreme Court had Hillary become president, me 
maybe she doesn't get rid of the pandemic task force. I don't see her overfunding the CDC. Do you? Do you see her not bailing out Wall Street? Do you see her being a little more hawkish when it comes to Venezuela? She had no problem with that coup in, was it Nicaragua? Or was it Honduras? I can't remember off the top of my head. She was part of what is now Libya taking out Muammar Gaddafi. That's an open air slave market now. So I'm not going to say the world would be a better place or a worse place with Hillary Clinton. It definitely would be different. The landscape would be worlds different. But she lost because she had a record, a record that Donald Trump could attack. She has a very centrist record. And it's the centrists that have kind of put the wood to the poor and working class for a long time. So when someone comes up and says, you know what, I'm going to bring back coal jobs in West Virginia. Motherfuckers in West Virginia get pretty fucking excited. Who the fuck is going to West Virginia and telling them they're going to bring back jobs? Especially jobs that literally harm the environment. But jobs that those people remember as being good jobs with benefits. And that's the dip, that was the difference between those people. Donald Trump just talked the talk. He ran to the left of her. But there was nothing that man had ever done in his life that was to the left of her, ever. A horrible failed businessman that destroyed other businesses in his wake. Leaves a trail of destruction. And then has a TV show for what, like 13, 14 years where he's just a dick. But that dickish behavior that people come came to love as the powerful strong man, right? In our moments of fear, our weakest moments, we choose monsters to protect us. He was going to be the monster that was going to protect us. We were going to be on the bad guy side and he was going to you know, lead us to victory. We were going to get the bad guy spoils. Well, not necessary. side is that it definitely activated the activists in a lot of us to want more because we had this kind of fiendish comic book villain in office and he is shown to be a humongous failure as he looks to the stock market as like his metric of success he goes on every day for the last, what is it, month or so, and has his coronavirus uh, talk in front of the press, which is just a campaign rally disguised as some sort of information, which is a lot of it is misinformation. There's a lot of lies. It's so bad. There are numerous stations that won't cover it. Um, now there's politics. If you watch that on uh Facebook or YouTube, one of the two. Um, you can watch it with a fact checker. 
and there's a dude that sits there and just checks the facts whenever Trump lies. And he's, yeah, it's pretty bad. And it's not just Trump. It's also when Pence gets up there and lies as well. So for those reasons alone, I think this is Donald Trump's Herbert Hoover moment. Herbert Hoover had a moment, not just with the stock market. He also had a tariff issue where he jacked up tariffs and, and a lot of uh, U.S. business people were telling him how horrible of an idea was going to be and it, it ended up hurting him. Um, but he had this thing called the uh, the bonus march. Where I, and I've talked about it before on the show, but in the bonus march, uh, these World War One veterans were due a bonus, I believe like 1945 or so, they were supposed to get paid this bonus of $3,000, which when you adjust for inflation is about 51 grand. And they started to... Uh, protest for to get the, the, the payment earlier and and Hoover sent the uh, military to basically stop these veterans from pro protesting and sent like McCarthy and uh, God who's the other one that people love so much MacArthur and Patton I can't remember off the top of my head I'll put a link in here so you can uh, of, of, of who was there um, and they, you know, pretty much decimated this this camp of leftover veterans that had been protesting uh, Congress for this this bonus. And at that moment, when FDR was like, "I I pretty much had this thing won. Like this guy fucked up." And coronavirus is Donald Trump's fucked up. Not that Donald Trump would have known that a pandemic was going to hit. <laughs> in an election year. Um, but there's been so many reports that have come out that he's been warned so many times and just didn't give a shit. And if you go back to Bush Jr.'s admi administration to Barack Obama's administration, part of that handoff was, hey, we need some sort of task force to handle these pandemics because I got hit with this bird flu shit wasn't ready for it. They say another one might be coming. Trump's administration just didn't care. So for that reason, I don't feel very confident that he stands any chance whatsoever. Because whatever shortcomings Joe Biden has as a politician, they haven't been on display to the level that Hillary Clinton's were on display. And I do believe there was some sexism in that. And a lot of the critiques of Biden are coming from the left because he hasn't been on the right side of history. He's one of those new Democrats that run to the right of the Democratic Party, historically the Democratic Party, right? So... The Democratic Party is supposed to stand for the working class. He definitely says, I'm not afraid to cut Social Security to prove my right-wing acumen. So there's, a, there's some problems with Joe Biden. Can we as a people force Joe Biden further to the left? I don't know. Who is his VP pick going to be? What's his cabinet going to be made up of? Is it going to be this Thomas Friedman dream team of neoliberal ghouls or is it going to be kind of a run-of-the-mill democratic cabinet that has wall street guys and oil industry guys sprinkled in here and there in key positions that don't really help american people we don't know yet but one thing i do know is that when Sanders stepped down, he did say he wanted to help with the fight against coronavirus and trying to help the American people. And there's a new stimulus package that actually makes a lot more sense um, where every American would get $2,000 a month as opposed to a one-time check of $1,200. Um, working for this very short time. And I will say that 
as I always say, I, I lived here um, in Soundwave Studios on Wood Street, literally across the street from an extremely large homeless encampment. So dealing with the homeless, um, it's not a hard transition. Unlike my coworkers, though, I can't just go home <laughs> and and disconnect from what I just was dealing with for eight hours plus. But one thing that I'm seeing that I definitely want people to understand, and, I, and I'll try to be as brief as possible, I've rambled for too long, is that we are only as well off as the least off of us. We are only as well off as the most vulnerable of us. And in this facility, people run the gamut. Old people, crippled people, or disabled people, I'm sorry. Lifetime homeless people. And when I say that, I don't mean their entire life, but you know, the majority of their life, they've probably been homeless. Or fought with housing insecurity. People that have fought drug addictions and alcohol addictions for long periods of time. Families, teachers, it runs the gamut. I can't say one race dominates in the facility because there's so many different types of people in the facility. There's so many of us that don't have access to health care. Think about that for a second. You're walking down the street, enjoying your day. Some person that doesn't have access to any sort of health care whatsoever that goes to the doctor with symptoms of COVID-19, the doctor tells them, mm, you're not sick enough, go home. That literally happened. A young boy died, 17 years old, Lancaster, California. I believe I've spoken about it before on one of these podcast episodes. But that person is going to come in contact with you. Even if you are kind of one of those, I, you know, I'll give them a dollar, but I don't want them to touch me. We're only as well off as that person is. If that person has no access to health care, they're going to sit on your bus stop, your bus you ride, your public transportation, your, your train system. They're going to walk into a, a store. They're going to go to the mall and use the bathroom when that's reopened. Everything is contaminated. And I don't say this as some sort of weird boogeyman scare tactic. I say this because we should have some sort of empathy. Because I can't believe the way people act towards those of us that don't have. It is a scary time in this country. Americans are dying at a rate faster than every other country in the world. The richest country in the world, the most powerful nation in the world, does not have a health care plan for its people. The numbers we are seeing do not count people that are dying in their homes. We are seeing stories where hospitals are piling bodies up in empty rooms, in refrigerator trucks, broken ventilators that are keeping people alive during a respiratory illness sent to hospitals from the federal government. The federal government has set no real guidelines on what to do and is in a crash course 
with death to reopen the economy. For what? I don't know who I'm going to vote for. I live in California. My state's probably going to flip blue. I could write in Bernie Sanders' name and feel real comfortable about myself if it's about that. But I know what I'm going to fight for. And I ask you guys to help me fight for this. We need universal health care in this country. Good people go broke paying for it good people ration what they can afford with life-saving medications like insulin. People in the richest nation in the world shouldn't die because they're rationing their insulin. I'm also going to fight for housing as a human right, not as a commodity but as a human right. When I open the door to the room for some of these people, their demeanor changes. It's a nice, clean, up-to-date facility. Not everybody's thankful off their ass. But if you don't believe that all of us at the very basic level should have shelter and health care and water, water. I was in a band called Le Fin Absolute Du Monde with my ex. There was a, a time we lived in our van, literally. We toured a lot, and we toured so much, we are like, you know what, maybe it makes sense for us to just live in a car. Why pay rent? We're going to work for a month, month and a half, and then we're going to go out for like three or four months So and tour, so let's just live in a van. What kept us healthy, clean? Our access to water shower we got gym memberships the gym that Cindy and I used to go shower at daily is closed like all fucking gyms are closed so all of the unhoused and and a lot more people than you think use the gym as a way to to shower there's a lot of unhoused people people that have been displaced through gentrification job loss you name it they uh they definitely used the planet fitnesses of the world to to shower at how do those people wash their hands when everywhere is closed Every, every news channel you turn on, wash your hands, wash your hands. Everyone needs to be washing their hands. Social distancing, washing your hands. How the fuck do you social distance when three people or four people are living in a car? How many of those people go to work more than you think? Where do they work? Well, now we call them essential workers. Not too long ago, we didn't call them that. Their work was not essential. The essential people were the people that are staying at home, working from some sort of Zoom call, and ordering DoorDash. Those were the essential people. Or the essential people were all these gajillionaires They constantly uh, buy back their stock uh, to inflate the price of their 
companies and don't pay living wages and bus unions. Like those are the people that I thought were supposed to be essential, right? That's what the playbook says. And the people that work at the Amazon warehouse aren't good enough or smart enough. They didn't apply themselves enough, right? The people that are delivering your food and work at the grocery store, kids. The people that just didn't, you know, they weren't that bright. Isn't that how the fucking stereotype works for who's essential and who's not essential? Well, it turns out that the most vulnerable of us are the most important. We need them. We want to clap for them and have these cute little fucking memes of them. But we don't know if we want them to have a living wage. Healthcare for everyone is just, it's a big step. Oh. In this pandemic situation, where we've seen these kind of disgusting photos of Las Vegas, where they've painted social distancing lines in the parking lot of a hotel as you look out on the strip and see empty hotels. The reason why those hotels will remain empty and those homeless people will remain on that sidewalk and people will share that fucking image all day long is because those hotels know they will lose so much business if homeless people go inside and stay there, even for a short time. At the converted hotel I'm working at, there's a few guys from the hotel that are that are there, and they said that they got phone calls where people were saying that we'll never stay in your hotel again. You have homeless people in there, and they were kind of appalled by that. You know, for the first reason, like you, first of all, you don't think we fucking clean these rooms, bitch? We clean it after you come here nutting all over the place. I'll give you this dollar if you don't touch me. I'll give you this half-eaten sandwich um, if you keep your distance away from me. I just can't sit where you sat. So you ask yourself, well, why? What are you afraid of? Cooties? Oh, because they could be sick. shelter for them. Again, richest nations in the world, tons of vacant housing. People like Steve Mnuchin and one of us, the corporation, we used to own so much.